Hello, everyone. Uh, today we have uh, Dr. Bao Won from uh, University of Utah to give us a numerical analysis uh, seminar talk. Uh, Dr. Bao Won is a assistant professor from the uh, Department of Mathematics and Scientific Computing and Imaging uh, Institute from University of Utah. He got his PhD from uh, uh, Michigan State University in 2016. And after that, uh, he was a assistant adjunct professor in mathematics at UCLA before joining uh, the University of Utah. His work has been uh, widely supported by uh, many agencies, including DOE and NSF, and he has won a lot of awards. And today he's going to talk about uh, implicit methods for deep learning. So uh, about the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to uh, speak here and uh, meet a lot of uh, friends. Uh, today I'm going to talk about the implicit methods uh, for deep learning. So first, uh, I talk about a classical deep learning paradigm. We have deep learning, it contains the model, for instance, the architecture, and the optimization algorithm. Sometimes you want to do like uncertain quantification, do some basic inference. We also need a sampling. So classical, uh, the architecture is defined as the composition of a simple affine and uh, nonlinear transformations. This F1 W is uh, uh, just like a w, w1 times x and then com uh, composed with a ReLU activation, for instance. And then I simply wrote it as this. It's a composition of simple functions. And then once we have this model, we can fit in a data, that's the x, xij. And then for the data, that's suppose we are training it in a supervised uh, approach. Then we can compare the loss L, F, W, X, I, J, Y, I, J. Then once I have this loss, I want to update the parameters uh, to make the loss smaller. So then I simply use the gradient descent because the, the, the number of training data can be very, very big. I use a mini batch stochastic gradient descent. And uh, sometimes if I want to, to have a distribution, I will use this Langevin dynamics. Uh, in terms, when we discretize the Langevin dynamics, it's essentially similar to the stochastic gradient descent. It's basically just adding a further adding a Gaussian law term. And some people even use this stochastic Langevin dynamics to study the behavior of stochastic gradient descent, even though there are some, some gaps. Well, excuse the, me, I'm sorry, Bao. That that parameter S is that a line search? Uh, this S is typically by tuning. We, we typically just set S for use uh, stage-wise uh, parameters. For instance, start from point one, and then after certain iterations, reduce by a factor of 10. And then after more iterations, reduce by a factor of 10 again. Oh, I see. Thank you. Mm -hmm. But then you're adding noise to it too, right? Uh, this adding noise is because we want to do sampling, to discretize Langevin dynamics. Thank you. Uh, the increase architecture has uh, become a very emerging research area. So there are several uh, very uh, popular models. The first one is uh, like a, a neural ODE. Neural ODE is uh, basically just an ODE, but the right hand side function is uh, a neural network. For instance, I do a, a two layer neural network for the right hand side. And then the further propagation for representation learning is uh, done by solving this ODE from some initial time to some terminal time. This is a neural ODE model. And uh, two years ago, people also proposed another model called a fixed point neural network or called a deep equilibrium model. It is given input data X, I define a neural network F theta, and then I have a latent state HK. Then I try to solve this uh, fixed point equilibrium equation. That the fixed point, the H star is the, the feature of X. And then there are also even more sophisticated uh, uh, models called a uh, differentiable optimization layer. It is try to learn the representation Z by solving this minimization problem. F theta ZX, X is your input, Z is the, the latent state okay, and subject to a certain constraint. So this one, we found the representation by solving the convex minimization problem. This, this three implicit architectures has drawn a lot of attention because a lot of nice mathematical and practical properties. For instance, it allows a much more flexible neural network design. Suppose I want to input a lot of points. I want my neural network output to be a convex hull of the input points. For the classical neural network, that seems impossible to do. But if we use this differentiable optimization layer, that becomes feasible. Excuse me, I have another uh, stupid question. Why yeah, do yeah, I yeah, support yeah. implicit architecture? Uh, because this architecture are not defined explicitly, right? Mm. 
right? Sorry, sorry. Explicit, for instance, uh, is a composition of simple functions, right? Just uh, an explicit function is fx, right? But then here, here, this, this map is something, I define this map by solving another equation. Yeah. Right? Th that's why this map is defined implicitly. That's why I call this implicit architecture. Thank you. Oh, sorry, Brian. Oh, yeah, no. while, we're, while we're on the slide, so how much can they or you or the community say about when these fixed point iterations converge? That's always kind of a question of oh, when do they actually, converge. That's, and that's an happens. excellent question. I will talk about that. Uh, oh, this, okay. you, you can give a sharp characterization using the uh, monotone operator theory. Perfect. Okay, so then first part I will talk about the neural OD. Okay, neural OD is uh, I try to learn the parameter theta. To, to fit the data. Suppose I have this dynamical system. I have a lot of points. Then I want to find a, find a differential equation to describe the dynamics. So the simplest idea is uh, I parameterize the F using a two layer neural network like theta two sigma theta one HT. Theta one, theta two are learnable. And uh, by the universal approximation theorem, I know this two layer neural network basically can approximate any function to arbitrary accuracy. Okay. So, uh, then the further propagation is I just try to solve this new, solve this OD from some initial time T0 to capital time Tn using a numerical OD solver. And uh, typically using an adaptive solver. The reason is that I don't, this model, I don't know the stiffness and sometimes I don't, I don't know the step size I should use. That's why I just use an adaptive step solver, but it's uh, quite expensive. Yeah. And then the backward propagation basically I need to update the parameter theta. For the people from the inverse problem community, typically we use the adjoint method. Right? So that, suppose the loss is there, then I just do ERD theta, which is the integral of this adjoint state, partial F, partial theta. And the AT, AT is the adjoint state set by another OD. Basically, when, when I learn your OD, for the propagation, I solve an OD. Backward propagation, I solve another OD. But the backward propagation solves the OD backward in time. There are several advantages of neural ODs. The first one is the depths, adaptive depths. We don't need to specify the depths for a given task. The, the depths should be task dependent. Depths model the models the model ca uh, capacity. So also when we train the model, it takes a constant memory because I just solved the OD. There is no need to, to store the intermediate state. And there are a lot of applications. For instance, then the irregular sample time series. And uh, these days people have used neural ODs for survival analysis, so for causal inference. All this uh, relate to learning irregular sample time series. And also for generative modeling, there is something called a continuous normalizing flow. For classical normalizing flow, we need to, to compute the determinator of the Jacobian matrix. It's similar to the Mount Jampier equation. But if we do this in continuous time, we just need to estimate the trace. So it's, mu it's much faster. For the fixed point neural network, uh, for the further propagation, we just need to find this equilibrium, find the equilibrium, Z theta, uh, Z star. Find Z star, certainly there are many algorithms like a Picard iteration, it's very slow. Sometimes we can accelerate using Anderson acceleration. Or we can direct solve this uh, system of uh, nonlinear equations using cosine Newton's method. Or we can use operator splitting to make it more flexible. Bao, uh, can I ask a question? I'm, I'm kind of lost here. Is this F sub theta the right hand side of some ODE that you're trying to learn from data? Okay. Yes. Right. So, so H would be, uh, I don't know, whatever your Lorentz system state. Is that how uh, it works? It's like a hidden state. You basically encode your data into a latent representation. Uh huh. Yeah, and then you you try to evolve your latent state and finally do a decoder. I see, but theta is the parameters of the network, right? Yes, theta, okay. theta one, theta two are the parameters. All right, thank you, got it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if you have a question, feel free to let me know. Then this is the fixed point network. So then fixed point network, because the fixed point is set by like z equal to f, theta z, x. Then when we do backward propagation, we can we need to compute the gradient, right? Partial L, partial theta, which is a partial L, partial Z star, partial Z star, partial theta. And then partial Z star, partial theta. This one, I can do the implicit differentiation because this is because Z star is the fixed point. So then 
I have this partial F theta of this star, partial of this star, partial of this star, partial of theta, then plus this one. This is the implicit differentiation. And then compute the partial Z star, partial of theta is essentially just need to solve this system of linear equations. Okay. And this one, system of linear equations, I can use, for instance, like kernel of subspace method. So it can be solved easily. And the advantage of this implicit differentiation is, again, memory efficiency. In particular, if you study some high capacity models like transformers, the memory cost is uh, basically we cannot afford that. So that's also it's not a memory efficient method, right? Uh, well, th this fixed point that way is memory efficient. Yeah, but GM res uh, the, the, the memory uh, depends on the iteration count, right? Uh, but still, GM res usually you just need a, like a very few iterations, there are not too many. But if you consider deep network, right? Deep network, you need to memorize all, all the hidden state and the gradient of that. That is a memory, like very, very expensive. This one, you don't need that. So you just need a few iterations of GM, right? That's it? Yes. Oh, okay. So then there are several advantages of fixed point network. First is adaptive depth, like constant memory footprint for training and highly expressive. You can prove this fixed point network is as expressive as a classical fit border network. And there are also a lot of applications like learning irregular sample time series, memory efficient transformers, and learning graph structure data. Okay. So today I will talk about a, a few researches. I will try, to, try my best to at least finish two of them. If time permits, I will talk about the, the third one as well. Okay, first is heavy uh, bond neural deep. We, we finished this paper like Almost, uh, almost one and a half years already. So this is a paper, I, my first paper uh, when I joined the University of Utah. So this is joint work with uh, He Di, he is a student at UCLA. Why was my previous student, Han Ji Tan, Tan was my visitor, Andrew and Stan. It's published in Europe last year. Let's first look at the, some bottlenecks of neural ODEs. First of all, when we do neural ODE, forward and backward propagation, we need to solve ODEs, high dimensional ODEs. And this ODEs can be very, very stiff. That, uh, we, if the ODE is very stiff and uh, we need to solve this or use very small step size, tiny step size. Therefore, we need to evaluate the right-hand side of function F at uh, many, many time steps. So then this, this result in very expensive, computational time expensive. So this is what we, we look at. So this, if we use a more accurate solver, you can see that the number of iteration increases very rapidly, okay? like from, from like 10 to 50, very, just use 10 to minus four ish. Okay? And also if we use more number of function evaluations, the computational time increases, not only forward, but also backward become more expensive. And as training goes, the number of function evaluation also increases. Then the takeaway is that NFE can be excessively high in training neural ODs, resulting in very complicated models. And as the training goes, the stiffness of neural ODs keep increasing. Another bottleneck, if you do some very simple analysis, you will see for the OD model, we have this estimate. Partial L, partial HT is partial L, partial H capital T, the exponential of this. This one is related to the learning of long-term dependency or long-range dependency because I have an input sequence and then I want my output to be dependent on the input that are far away from the terminal time. But based on this estimate, if this partial F theta partial H is on the, out of control, so this one, if capital T minus little t increases, this will go to zero very quickly. Partial L partial H little t vanishes, then we cannot learn long-range dependencies. So this I call it the learning bottlenecks of neural D. Then we need to resolve these two bottlenecks. We proposed the following model. <laughs> it's a second order OD. D square H T D T square plus gamma D H D T is equal to F theta. F is just a neural network. And the gamma D H D T is the damping term. Uh, I think for, for mathematicians, this is a trivial model. It's just a user to model the damped oscillator. And uh, F theta is a neural network. We can rewrite this one as a coupled first order system. DH dt equal to mt, this is the momentum state. And dm dt equal to minus gamma plus F theta. Yeah. Uh, by, by doing this decoupling, we can implement this algorithm just using ex existing adjoint method. 
So uh, this this OD is uh, the limit continuous limit of the classical heavy ball method for optimization. That's why I call it uh, heavy ball OD, heavy ball neural OD. And then uh, we need to optimize the parameter theta uh, by using the data. So then again, we need to do the adjoint analysis. The adjoint state of the heavy ball OD is set by this, uh, this one, d square at dt square minus gamma d at dt equal to at times this. So because we are going to solve this uh, adjoint, adjoint OD backward in time from capital T to zero, so just uh, doing the uh, change of variable, we, we have this d square bt tau d tau square plus gamma db tau d tau equal to this one. And uh, so that means the adjoint OD has the same damping term as the uh, original forward OD. So uh, we have, uh, that means if we can so solve the forward, forward OD faster, then we can solve the backward OD much faster as well. Later, we will, we will give a theoretical interpretation. Why do you imagine we can solve this second order OD much easier? And we also noticed that the, the, adjoint, the hidden state, the hidden state HT of the new OD usually increases very rapidly. Okay. So this was also observed in a previous paper by some, some people from Oxford. And to tackle this problem, we further generalize our proposed heavy bond neural OD. We first adding a gating mechanism, sigma, and then we also add the skip connection. Then this is the generalized heavy bond neural network. And then generalized heavy bond neural network can, can like control the aggregation of the hidden state. If you look at this, the hidden state. That, are you, I'm sorry, are you still solving the same problem though? Or are you changing the problem by uh, introducing the gating and the skip connection? Yes, yeah. So, uh, and we found it's very useful <laughs> for this OD setting. Okay. So this, this example shows it's uh, indeed very, uh, uh, very effective in controlling the uh, aggregation of the hidden state. Now, uh, this can also help the non-run dependency. Uh, for the original neural OD, we, we already showed the, the, the hidden state satisfies this partial L, partial HT is the expansion of this. But for the heavy ball neural OD or generalized heavy ball neural OD, we have the following result. Partial L, partial HT. T, partial L, partial MT, satisfy this equation. Expansion of, this is not an arbitrary matrix. If we call this matrix M, you will see this matrix M has some very nice property. The angle values, we have two N angle values. Then we can group them into N pairs. The sum of each pair is a constant. Therefore, the, some angle values are not too small. Right? If some angle values are not too small, then this adjoint state will not vanish. So yeah, for the people who is familiar with the, the heavy ball analysis, right, the classical momentum, the basically the acceleration is just based on I rotate the angle values to make the, the magnitude, to control the magnitude. So that's the same philosophy we use to analyze the non-range dependency. So Bao, can you say just a tiny bit more about why it has that eigenvalue structure? Uh, no, you, you consider, uh, uh, okay, maybe I will go back to this uh, in two minutes. Okay, so, okay, that's totally fair. Okay, thank okay. you. Yeah. Uh, so, another, can I ask another question? So I'm sure you know about the nest drop method, right? And that has the, it's even more efficient than heavy ball, and that's uh, a continuous time version, right? Yeah. Uh, that, what happens if you use that one instead? That one, you know, nest drop is not stable, right? It's an oscillatory. Yeah. So then, then uh, we, we found that if you use that, one, then the hidden state basically uh, it's not stable at all. You cannot use that for long, long term simulation. And uh, another issue was uh, if you look at it, this one, can long run dependency is basically just because of the angle value structure. For that job, we don't have angle value, just some special angle value structure. Is that matrix M, is that diagonalizable or does it have a Jordan block? Uh, it's, uh, not necessary. No, we, we will go back to this. Uh, we will do some simple analysis later. Oh, I'm That's sorry. 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 Oh, don't no worry. Don't no worry. Yeah. So then we do this uh, adjoint state visualization. We see that the uh, heavy bond duality and the generalized heavy bond duality really learn non run dependence. The adjoint state will not vanish as the capital T minus little t increases. But for the standard duality, as you can see, all these are blue, blue region means zero. This is a task for the work 2D kinematic simulation. Basically, I want to learn the motion of uh, robot, uh, uh, robotics. Okay. So this is, uh, shows the, the heavy bond neural and generalized heavy bond neural can learn our independence. 
Okay. Uh, then we also showed the this is uh, as the training goes, heavy bond generates heavy bond. The NFE, the computation is much more efficient because the standard neurality or another model is called augmented neurality. The number of function variation increases very quickly. And uh, not only training, but also during the test time. And also this is a test loss. You see that our model is remarkably more accurate. Okay. And we also do this simple image classification to show the computational, we are much more more efficient. We contrast our heavy ball and the general heavy ball with the three benchmark models. The first one is the neurality, second one is the augmented, third one is the second order. You see that original neurality, if I use 10 to minus five backward, it can take like 700 iterations, but our general heavy ball takes like many 50 or 70 at most. So it's like 10 times more, 10 times faster. Next, okay, go back to your, you guys question. I will show why why heavy bond already takes much less NFEs. We will do this uh, angle manual analysis. Okay. It's basically because uh, this momentum term can reduce the stiffness of the OD system very aggressively. Let's consider this original OD, new OD. I can write it as uh, linearized it. Okay, dHdt equal to a times ht, and then for the momentum one, it's basically just uh, I can rewrite it as this uh, coupled system, right? zero i a minus gamma i. Okay. And then if A has an angle value lambda, let's just consider uh, two, one dimensional case. Yeah. If A is lambda, then this two by two system is zero, one, zero minus gamma, right? Right, and then this is a quadratic problem. Then the angle value, two angle value, that's called the Vitas formula, right? Lambda one plus lambda two will be minus gamma. And if you do the integral, we will have a T, capital T minus little t times gamma. That's why the sum of two angle values is a constant. And for, for this case, we, we can show that if the original A, the stiffness is kappa one, then for the stiffness of B will be less than up to square root of kappa one. So it becomes much less stiff. Okay. I hope I answer you guys' questions. And uh, how to do uh, how to generalize this analysis to the neural network case? We need uh, we need uh, to use uh, some more theory. No, neural tenure kernel theory. It's uh, a linearized version of neural network. So we have also uh, uh, applied this to some scientific computing problem. For for instance, for the reduced order modeling, this is our observed uh, flow models, and then we want to learn the dynamics of this flow. So we first uh, we just use the uh, then, then the purple orthogonal decomposition, then this temporal coefficients using the heavy bond neurality. This is a paper just uh, got accepted to the Journal of Scientific Computing, a special issue. So we, we use this framework. First, uh, for this temporal coefficients, we use the uh, encoder, encoder to encode this into the hidden, hidden state, latent state, HT and MT. Then I use this heavy bond neurality to evolve the, the latent state. Finally, I do a decoder to predict the, the temporal coefficients. And then we contrast our model with the neural data. As you can see that for this uh, learning reduced order models, we are much more efficient, not only in training, but also in testing. Okay. And this is another case to show it's much more efficient. Okay, so then that, that's basically the first part of my talk. Do you have any question? Okay, if, uh, if no questions, then I will go to the second part. So your measure of uh, complexity is the neural function evaluations, right? Yes. Are, are all the function evaluations, are they comparable, but or could some be more expensive than others, depending on the network? Uh, that's a good question. If you look at our method, right, we, we basically still just evaluate the neural network once. We, we just have a, a momentum state. That, that's uh, very cheap to do. It's basically each function evaluation, the, the computational time, are, Almost the same for both the neural and the heavy bond neural. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So, if no question, then okay. Second part, I will talk about the fixed point neural network. Well, we just finished a paper: stable, efficient, and flexible monotone neural uh, operator in place of graph neural network. With my student Justin Baker, who is a uh, uh, very smart guy, and also my postdoc Xin Song. He, uh, his background was uh, differential geometry, but he is uh, interested in doing machine learning, and then we. In a month, uh, uh, so he joined it in the summer, and then we already finished this paper. I'm quite uh, excited about this paper. Now, let me uh, explain this paper. 
First, in many real world data, there are a lot of Euclidean. So for instance, like social graph, 3D mesh, and also molecular graphs. Then these are not Euclidean data. We have to describe them using a graph. So then we want to do machine learning on this. A natural choice is certainly build a neural network on graphs. Then how to do that? <laughs> the classical approach is the message passing. Suppose uh, we have a graph, G is a VE, V is the vertex set, and the E is the edge set. So then I let A to be the adjacent matrix of the graph, and the W is the initial node feature whose ice column is exactly the node feature of the ice node. Then I do the graph convolution. ZK plus one is sigma, W, ZK, G. G is a graph related matrix. For instance, I can choose this as the as this, just a I plus A, A is just I is identity, and then I normalize it. So this is a classic choice. Basically, if I have a graph, Know the features ZK. Then I first just try to mix them by message passing. And then I use this uh, learnable feature to further uh, fuse the feature. Then, then I do activation. So this is just a one layer of graph neural network. And then I can, I can concatenate many, many layers to make a deep, deep network. Okay. So this has been a benchmark model for uh, graph machine learning. So this was first proposed by uh, uh, Kip and Willing in uh, ICR 2017 paper. And then later there are a lot of other people propose uh, similar models. So this has a lot of applications. For instance, uh, in this recommended system, I want to do the edge prediction. Like I have users, I, have, uh, I want to predict whether this user likes the product or not. So uh, I have a lot of data, but I just want to predict if there is a link or not. This is the edge prediction. And uh, then I also have this uh, node classification. This is, uh, for instance, for the social network, I want to predict if there is any bad guy in the network. Right. So node classification, good guy and bad, or bad guy. And this is also very useful in, uh, in some scientific computing problems. For instance, for quantum chemistry, computing some, uh, some properties of this, uh, chemical. Classically, we can use the density function theory, but it's very expensive. For a single calculation, it can take several hours. But if you we use a neural network, it's just take like a, like a fraction of seconds. That's why people believe AI for science is like a very promising area. The breakthrough prize was awarded to the people who pioneered the AI for science this year. And then there are several bottlenecks of graph neural networks. The first one is how to determine the depth of the graph neural network, right? Give you a, a task. Sometimes you have to base on the trial and the error, so it's expensive. Another issue was uh, because local aggregation, local aggregation, after one step, uh, I and my labors will become closer to each other. And after many, many steps aggregations, everything will become identical. So this is in graph neural network, this is called over smoothing. So that means if I have a very deep graph neural network, it will not help at all. Right? Because you imagine everything becomes the same, that all nodes become indistinguishable. And the GNs can only learn local information since each layer enables a node to aggregate one additional hook neighbors. And I cannot build a very deep model using the classical graph neural network. So people have proposed a new model called an implicit graph neural network based on this fixed point equation. It's basically uh, iterated as follows. ZK plus one is sigma, WZKG. Uh, WZKG is the same as the previous one. But now I just have this, uh, uh, it's like a source term, uh, GBXX is your input. Okay, I keep adding this input in the iteration. And then this one, I don't care about how many iterations I need. I just try to find a fixed point of this model. Find the fixed point of this model. Then again, the first question is just a rough question. How can I, how to determine the, the convergence of the fixed point? When this will converge? The simplest one idea was if I put this matrix G as what we presented, I plus A, and normalize it, because all angle values are like in minus one to one. Then, what is uh, what is X here? X is your input and node features. And Z was what? The Z is the is, I thought W was a rectangular matrix. It was D by N. Uh, yes, yes. W is not less than rectangular. W is not less than. It, it's 
Oh, oh, sorry, so W is a rectangle. Yeah, w but is you're rectangle. saying they're the, uh, the eye, largest eigenvalue of W, but if it's rectangular, then? Uh, then you just consider the singular value. Right? Oh, the singular, okay, fine, sure. Yeah, and then uh, according to the, uh, the parent for Benio's uh, theorem, uh, lambda one of the absolute value of W is uh, mainly the spectral radius of the matrix W. Right? So this is a classical characterization of the well postness of this model. But then this model, if W, the, the, all the angle values are less than one, so then the capacity is quite limited. So then there are several bottlenecks of the model. First is, uh, uh, we want can to I, learn- Can I ask a question very quickly uh, on the first? Uh, yeah, so uh, so does this result depend on your information, uh, the, the X that you passed in, like, or how you pick the uh, the GB uh, function well, in this fixed network? Oh, that's, that's an excellent question. So uh, the convergence, right? If this sigma is a contraction map, right? Like the sigma is a contraction mapping of Z, right? Then it will converge. So it, it's independent of GB. X. Okay. So uh, is is sigma some activation function? What is it? Uh yeah, uh sigma is just a naive redo. Okay. But your matrix W has to be square if you're invoking Peron for Brinus. Uh okay. Uh, yeah, it, uh, it's, it's columns are the features, right? Okay. Uh, the the column of Z are the features, the the lender features. Okay. So then let's look at uh, IGN can learn long run dependency. So here long run dependency means in a graph for any given node, I want to the, it can reach to the, to the nodes that's far away from it. So then I basically need to do many, many iterations of this uh, fixed point iteration. Because each iteration via message passing, it can only aggregate information from one hoop, one additional hoop labels. So then here yeah, to learn long run dependency. Each node, because each node can only aggregate information from one from the nodes that's far away. We, we, we need to, this is how we can learn our dependency. But to learn our dependency, in that case, lambda one W need to be close to one. Otherwise, the PK iteration will converge very fast. It will converge very fast, so it cannot learn our dependency. For instance, we test on a simple task called directed chain classification. This data set contains C classes. And each each uh, each uh, data is a chain, and the, only the first uh, node is neighbored. All the other nodes are not neighbored. And then I want to predict the last node of this the chain. So then I do this. I do this one. And then the the first row as a classification accuracy as I run the model, train the model, the training accuracy, validation accuracy, test accuracy. The first one is the chain of length one hundred. The second one is the chain of length. Uh, 250. As you can see that for the chain of lens 100, it can almost uh, then classify it perfectly. But for the chain of uh, lens 250, the classification accuracy is just like random guess because this is a binary chain. Okay. And then why this happened? We investigated the angle values of the, of the system of this lambda one and lambda two W. So look at this. So the first one is for the 100, we see that the angle value converges to one as the accuracy in particular. Once the accuracy reached to 100%, you can see the angle value are very close to one. But uh, for, for 250, as we can see that the angle value, the largest angle value converges to something like a very small value. Right? And uh, so also we look at- the me, I'm so sorry, your notation. So when you say absolute value of W, does that mean <laughs> you're taking the positive definite part of W? Because uh, it's, the second eigenvalue may not be real, right? Uh, I just uh, take the uh, take the uh, absolute value of the matrix. Just element-wise absolute value? Yes, yes, element-wise. Okay. Yeah. So, and here, this is the, the magnitude, magnitude of the angle value. This, this lambda one, I should say, this is the magnitude of the angle value. And uh, then for, for this 100, the last issue was even though it becomes accurate, but then the, this uh, iteration also takes a much, much more iteration. Like, uh, computation is very expensive. So then there are uh, two problems. One is uh, in training IGNs, we want the magnitude of lambda one W to close to one, but this may not happen because W is from a random matrix. I want to, after the training, the largest angle value goes to one. So this certainly cannot, may not happen. 
Another issue is the peak iteration can converge very slowly if lambda one goes to one. This is I based on the classic of peak iteration, the theory of peak iteration. So then I want something to go beyond peak iteration. That's why we uh, we will use uh, monotone operator theory. But before that, we just uh, summarize the bottlenecks of uh, this uh, implicit model. First, it, it has limited expressivity because of we require lambda one w to be less than one. So this uh, this one we can do this by doing some project within descent, and it cannot learn non-random dependence if lambda one w of the trend IG is not close to one, and also it suffers from slow convergence because of using peak iteration. So these are three bottlenecks we are going to overcome. Okay. Now we are going to re, uh, to re, uh, consider this model from the uh, model operator theory perspective. So ZK plus one is sigma, then we can vectorize it. Vectorize it, then we, we can use this chronic product, right? G transpose the chronic product with something, then vector ZK plus the source term. So then we know uh, that uh, finding the fixed point is equivalent to solve the monotone inclusion problem. Uh, we want to find the zero of F plus G vectorized Z. Okay. Well, F is, uh, F is the operator basically just I minus G transpose the chronic W uh, vector Z minus the source term. And G is another operator. G is uh, the partial of F, the sub, the sub, sub differential of the uh, closed, uh, convex closed purple function. And uh, uh, in particular, sigma, uh, F, F is a function such that sigma is the prox of F. And uh, for the real case, F is simply the, in, the indicator of the positive octant. So this is the basic, I just reformulate the fixed point iteration from as a monotone inclusion problem. And then for the monotone inclusion, uh, we, we can redesign the model. Okay. So this, I call this uh, MIG because uh, we just look at this from monotone operator theory. And then the fixed point Z exists and is unique. If F is strongly monotone, F, F operator is here. F is here, and F is strong in monotone. If I want I minus G transpose uh, chronic with W to be to be strong, uh, to be like uh, is minus MI is a positive semi definite. So I basically just require this condition. <coughs> this Sorry, is. Uh, can, can you remind us what G is here? Uh, G is the graph matrix. Oh, okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So then this condition is a sharp characterization of the well postness of the monotone IGN. Next, we just try to parameterize it. <clears throat> so uh, because we consider this model, right? Consider this is a monotone, uh, monotone IGN model. So ZK plus one is sigma than this one. And then here, we basically first need to redesign this graph matrix. We want this graph matrix, all angle values to be positive. First, to be all positive. Then we just set this to be the normalized Laplace matrix. And then in that case, I want I minus G transpose cross with the uh, cross product, chronic product with W to be a positive definite. In that case, I can parameterize W as follows. It's just one minus M times I. M is any positive number minus a CC transpose plus F minus F transpose. This is also sufficient and less so, okay, a sharp result. So the uh, C and F are arbitrary matrix. So uh, then with this uh, parameterization, this guarantees the well postness. And uh, if we look at uh, this parameterization, this parameterization allows the angle values of W to be much less than minus one, much less than one, minus one. But uh, in the original, if we use the peak iteration, the angle values need to be less than one. So then this model becomes more expressive. And uh, another parameterization is that uh, another issue we mentioned is learning down range dependency because the angle values of W may not converge to one. We want the angle values to converge to one. Therefore, we use this orthogonal parameterization in particular called a Kelly map. Kelly map is I minus S times I minus plus S inverse. This matrix is guaranteed to be orthogonal where S is a screw symmetric matrix. And we can parameterize S as C minus C transpose. C is an arbitrary matrix. Because this is the orthogonal matrix, then all the angle values have the magnitude of one. And uh, to ensure the non dependency, we simply need a five sigma, five gamma to converge to one. That's it. Yeah. 
Okay, so we have already exception model. The next is uh, how to compute the model. How to, how to compute this, uh, the, how to compute the fixed point of this stuff. That's also, uh, computation can be very challenging. Okay. We, we work, first the strategy is uh, we can use a forward or backward splitting. We can find the fixed point by using the following iteration. This is, I basically introduce another uh, parameter, alpha. Then uh, this prox alpha is uh, just defined as here. Then this, I can, I can implement this using two steps iteration. ZK plus one or two is ZK minus alpha times this, basically just uh, this one. I set this to an intermediate state. And then next I do the prox. This is uh, called the forward backward splitting. But the forward backward splitting, uh, it has a Lipschitz constant, it's, it's bounded by this. And we need to choose a popular alpha. So certainly it will, it can converge. But if the, if W, because when we use the monotone parameterization we mentioned before, right, the W angle value can be much less than minus one. So uh, the, the spectral radius of W can be very, very big. In that case, this, uh, the Lipschitz constant can be very big. Therefore, uh, the forward backward convergence can be very slow. That's the issue of the forward backward splitting. So then another splitting is the piecemeal rashford splitting. We can find the fixed point by doing the following. That, that is this side to be the proxy of u star. Then we can we just try to find the, the u star. Vectorize it and then the vectorize the uk plus one is uh, I can do this uh, two resolvent operators, C uh, resolvent of F and resolvent of G, and then on vector U. Then resolvent operator are defined as uh, uh, two times the, the uh, oh, sorry, this is a candy operator. That candy operator is a uh, two times resolvent minus the identity operator. Okay. So here maybe I make it a mathematically quite heavy. And uh, uh, it's basically just uh, some classical splitting schemes. Okay. Uh, in a lot here, we can rewrite this as follows. Rewrite the piecemeal rashford as follows. UK plus one is uh, two times V and act on this one, act on this uh, vector and then minus another vector. Well, V is, uh, V I need to compute the, in, to invert a large matrix, I plus alpha, I minus G transpose chronic with W. So if G is a D by D, uh, G is uh, D by D, W is also by D by D, then this will be D square by D square. So this matrix, V is very, very big. To compute the inverse, that's uh, infeasible. Well, the good thing is uh, we, can, we can compute this uh, using the, uh, but it's Stuart algorithm. So this is uh, also a classical algorithm. Th this one, I don't need uh, to compute, to invert a D square by D square matrix, but I just need to diagonalize, uh, uh, diagonalize two matrices G and W. Okay. So that's uh, how, we how we compute this. Well, exactly, we can use the Barty Stuart algorithm. And uh, you may ask uh, other operator splitting schemes, for instance, for the Douglas Rashford splitting, Douglas Rashford splitting. In our case, because we can, uh, we can choose alpha, it's always converge. Then uh, Pismer Rashford is always faster than Douglas Rashford. So that's why we only consider Pismer Rashford and uh, and uh, for the backward. So then in, another idea is instead of doing exact calculation, we can do some truncation, do some Lorentz the, the series approximation. In particular, if W is an orthogonal matrix, then we can certainly do the Lemma series expansion. Notice that V U K, this matrix V times U K, we can write it as follows. And then this, this one, I do the Lemma series expansion. Lemma series expansion. So here we need some, some simple uh, algebraic calculation. Then I insert from I from zero to infinite, I from I from zero to capital K only. Just do some truncation to truncation to the capital K terms. And then the case order during my series approximate Pittsman rush for the iteration. I can write, I can replace the original vector V, uh, matrix V as two times NK back on this. So another idea was uh, instead of just uh, using the, uh, the original matrix A, I can do the high order, do the diffusion. Then I can set G to be D, uh, just A plus high, high powers of the matrix A. And then this matrix, by certain normalization, still guarantee the well process of the model. Finally, together with- Do you compute these powers explicitly? Uh, th this one, uh, yeah, we need to store this the matrix. Oh, well, that's yeah. time consuming and memory consuming, right? We have uh, to but, but we just need to compute it once. 
Right. Yeah, just a computed ones. That, well, finally, we have this model that uh, replaces the matrix, uh, replace the matrix G with this uh, diffusion matrix. Replace it with the diffusion matrix. And then we can use uh, Pisman Rashford and the uh, and the Ford backward splitting. In particular, in the Ford, in the Pisman Rashford splitting, we can do the Loima series approximation. So I denote the model as MIGNK, means the, the using K terms in the Loima series approximation. And DP means the piece power in the diffusion. So this okay. is the, the, the final model we got. And then let's look at the performance of the model. Can I, can I ask a quick question? Uh, so, so this K-hop version, uh, is this related to like the over smoothing thing that you talked about earlier? Like when you are aggregating uh, more information from like uh -huh. uh, multi-scale like models, uh, multi-scale uh -huh. neighbors uh, as part of the model or is it uh -huh. somewhere very different? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, here, this is uh, a bit different from over smoothing. This is about a uh, long range dependencies in a graph. For instance, suppose you have a graph, the diameter is very, very large. Right? The diameter means uh, for, for, for a node from, to, the, to its largest, uh, to the, its, uh, like the, another node with the longest distance is very big. In that case, if I want the, this node to reach the, uh, the furthest away node, I need to do many, many iterations. Right? Yeah, with but these the, powers, with the sum of powers, you basically add walks to the yes. graph, right? Yes, mm -hmm. yes, yes. Indeed, that, that's, uh, if, uh, if you write this into a matrix, essentially just that. I see, thank you. Mm -hmm. So then this is an invention model, and then we test the performance. Uh, so we still do the chain classification. Left is a binary chain. Right is a three class. Uh, the three class classification. We can see that this red one is just a standard IGN using the PK iteration. And certainly for IGN, we can also using a diffusion mechanism just to re replace the the graph matrix with a diffusion convolution. Okay. So then, but the accuracy still not very good. But if we do this uh, MIG using the monotone and the uh, Pitman Rashford splitting, you can see that our accuracy is almost always one hundred percent. So this shows uh, by doing this treatment is much more accurate. And uh, also computational is more uh, more efficient. We can see that uh, this one is about accuracy. Red one, red one is MIGN and uh, blue one is IGN. You can see that uh, we are more accurate. We are con uh, this one, we are more accurate, but uh, then we are computational, we are more efficient. The first one is uh, for two class. Third, second, second row is for the three class. This is the accuracy, and then this uh, iteration. You can see th this action is because of the limitation of the PK iteration. So it's very slow. And the second row is the accuracy for the three class. As you can see, we are more accurate. But also, you can take a look at the iteration. We just need around 100, but the PK iteration is 300 to, to reach 100% accuracy. And uh, always also, this uh, PK iteration is not stable because uh, sometimes the angle menu may not converge to one. And we also do a graph classification. I give a give you a graph, and then I want to classify the entire graph into a certain category. This uh, five benchmark tasks from some bioinformatics uh, applications. So now we can check this MIG. Uh, this uh, symmetry denotes the uh, monotone parameterization. N1D1 means uh, this. Uh, Pisman Rashford with the orthogonal parameterization. We can contrast not only with IGN. IGN is always not good, but our model sometimes can even beat the other state of the art model. Actually, our model in general, statistically, like, performs the best. Okay. So that's the second part of my talk. And the second part is quite a mathematical intensive because if you don't know much about operator theory, maybe a bit harder to understand. But uh, well, we have already submitted the paper. The paper is uh, available uh, on open review. If you are interested, can take a look at that. Okay. So I have, uh, uh, how, how much time uh, well, do I have? Uh, well, technically you have 10 more minutes, but uh, if you want to save a few minutes for questions, uh, like depending okay. on like uh, your time. Oh, okay, maybe I can spend a, a few more minutes to finish the last part and then uh, quickly finish the last part and go to questions. So the last part is uh, I want to, instead of doing a discrete graph neural network, I want to do a continuous time graph neural network. Right? How about I directly parameterize a PDE on graph and using this PDE to do graph learning. 
So this is a paper we published in ICR last year. So it's a joint work with uh, Matthew Sop. He is an assistant professor at the uh, University of Manchester, Hadi Pan and uh, Thomas Schirmer. This is the first paper I had with Thomas Schirmer, but I had a, a lot of uh, proposals with Thomas Schirmer. And uh, Andrew, I understand. So first, uh, again, look at the diffusion equation on graphs. Diffusion equation on graphs, basically I have this uh, partial xt, partial t. In the simplest case, it's just uh, the Laplace matrix minus L xt. Uh, if this one, you can think about it, just the discretization of a diffusion, 1D diffusion equation using the central finite difference, then it's essentially the similar thing. And then this L is the Laplace matrix I minus A. Okay. And if we discretize this, we can resemble the, the original graph neural network. So this is a graph diffusion network model. Okay. Then, so the graph neural diffusion, basically I start from this X, input X, then I encode the X. Uh, to get some latent state. And then I use this uh, to solve a PDE, to solve a PDE to do the representation learning. X capital T is X zero plus integral zero to T, partial X T, partial T. And the partial, partial X T, partial T is this diffusion equation. And A is the self attention. A is basically just a model this uh, diffusivity, pairwise diffusivity. And finally, after that, I use a decoder to do the prediction. This model was proposed by Ch Chamberlain in, in ICML 2021. So there are, again, several uh, bottlenecks. Why is, uh, because it's a diffusion, eventually all node features becomes identical. That's called the over smoothing, the same, okay. Another issue was uh, it, it's not good for learning with uh, limited supervision. For instance, we tried this one. If uh, we tried several node classification tasks, Cora set is a type of matter. If each class, I have 20 neighbor points, the ac accuracy is like 80%. But if I reduce that, for instance, to five, the accuracy will reduce by like more than 10%. So that, that uh, graph you know, typically the labeling rate is very low. I want to, to break this curse. So the, our idea was we first uh, revisit the diffusion from the random work viewpoint. We, we design this random work model for the diffusion equation. And then we prove that for the original model, the stationary distribution is independent of your initial load feature. This is the stationary distribution of the diffusion model. And then we want to modify the diffusion equation, modify the diffusion equation by adding a source term, by adding an appropriately designed source term. This source term can guarantee existence of the station distribution. Meanwhile, the station distribution will be dependent on your initial feature. Then certainly it solves the over smoothing problem. This way we have the following theoretical guarantee. Basically after K situation, then ZI, the, the feature of the S node is basically just this one. This is dependent on your initial node feature. So this shows it proves it overcomes over smoothing. And also, uh, we, we test the performance, just as the depth, you can see that we contrast our grand plus plus. Plus plus means add a source term. And uh, also the original grant, you can see that as the depth increase, our accuracy sometimes may even increase, but grant itself, uh, the accuracy drops substantially. And uh, also we, we learn with uh, limited labels, which uh, label they know just one. And uh, you can see that our grand plus plus, as depth increases, the accuracy increases, but uh, grand, the, as depth increases, the accuracy drops. And uh, as depth increases, the gap becomes larger. And as a summary, uh, I essentially spend, uh, I talked about heavy bond URD uh, like for uh, half an hour. And uh, the heavy bond URD, the, we can guarantee two things. First is accelerate both the forward and the backward OD solvers because the model becomes less stiff. Second is it helps the nonlinear dependency because the angle values are uh, not arbitrary. And I also talk about a monotone operator based in place of graph neural network. It's more stable because the angle values can easily converge to one and the accurate for graph learning. And also it converges faster than classical PK iteration and it can help the nonlinear dependencies. The last part I briefly uh, like just uh, overviewed was the um, graph neural diffusion with a source term. It's a PDE on the graph. And it can help learning with the deep architectures and also learning with limited situation. So these are the references. So we have a few minutes for questions.
Thank you very much, Bell. Uh, that's a very nice talk. Uh, it, you covered a lot of ground. And I think we've already got a lot of interesting uh, questions uh, along your talk. Uh, but do we have any uh, other questions from the audience? I have a short question. Senior, yes, you have to say, um, I'm on, uh, I'm not muting that. Yeah? I'm Kazito. Do you hear me? Uh -huh. okay? Yes, yeah, I can. Yeah. I think you did good uh, relaxation overall, but somebody asked is the sharpness lost by relaxation from the solution sharpness in discretization actually in the classification you may lose some effectiveness uh-huh so can, can you uh, repeat your question so you you do all relaxation uh, uh -huh. oh okay okay yeah um, yes. <laughs> solution in a more stable and more robust manner which implies uh -huh. sharpness uh -huh. of the solution method may not be the same uh, well, that one, uh, the, for, for instance, for the high power OD, right? Uh, we just want to then then a feature, but we don't. This feature representation may not be unique. That's why the performance may still be as good as the previous one, or even better. Right? Even though the representation we learned is different from the original dual OD, this model even though it's different from the previous one. So you know, reformulations could be better than the original. Yes. Yes. Oh. Yeah. Okay, that's a good point. Okay, you reform it and make it robust, but still better. Okay, yes. Good. Thank you. That's the message. Yeah? You can reform, reform it. You don't want to do the purpose. Yeah? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh -huh. yeah. Thank you for your question. Yeah, so uh, do we have any other questions? Uh, I'm right, going so, uh, to on the chat. Uh, oh, yeah, this is um, like some of uh, the audience oh, yeah. have to leave because of the uh, the schedules. Uh, let me stop the recording and we can chat a bit more. Okay, okay, okay.